Church family, if you have your copy of God's Word, whether you have a printed copy as I prefer or a device with an app on it, I want you to find the book of Jeremiah and I want you to find the 19th chapter. For those of you who are guests of ours and we have many today joining us online or here with us live, we've been walking through the book of Jeremiah for over a year now. We believe that is the most faithful way to milk God's Word of all of the nutrients that it has for us spiritually to preach through the scriptures expositionally. And we're in a sermon series in these middle chapters of the book of Jeremiah called Reworked. And that series is based off of a passage that Adam Siski, our high school pastor and soon to be our first satellite campus pastor in the fall as he goes down to begin the work in the Woodruff community, preached last week out of the book of Jeremiah chapter 18. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 4, the Bible says, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. And of course, Jeremiah 18, Adam's passage last week, takes us to the potter's house where Jeremiah is observing, observing the potter take an unformed lump of wet clay and forming it and reforming it according to his will. The metaphor is beautiful and simple. God, when we are soft and pliable, will rework us when there becomes cracks when there becomes imperfections, he has the ability to reshape, to push down, to remold in his sovereign hands. We're going to stay in the potter's house today, but we come to a more difficult text. Mothers, you're going to get all kinds of stuff today. Flowers, perhaps lunch, for heaven's sake, buy her lunch. I'll tell you what is her love language, a nap. <laughs> Buy her lunch and leave her alone. And many of you with little children will receive small pieces of art that they've prepared for you. Others of you with teenagers will receive a card in it. Perhaps there'll be a gift card or maybe they'll step up to do something for you. Some of you have those children that will get you something nice tomorrow. <laughs> but one of the things I've often found about every mother I see, no matter what she's handed, no matter what she gets, she adores it. Mothers have all kinds of emotions. Of course, obviously, they're human. And they express their emotions like anyone else. My mother's a very passionate woman. She's where I get my sense of humor. She loves to laugh. She has an incredible capacity to love people. She was, for many years, a faithful pastor's wife. I spoke to her yesterday due to the nature of my day today and asked her what she was doing. And because of a background in floristry work, she was doing the flowers for a young girl in their church to help this young lady save money, always finding ways to serve other people. But my mom could get mad, real mad. Now, thank God I have one brother. It was always his fault. <laughs> I never made my mom mad. If you're watching online, mom, do not message contradictory to my message. <laughs> I remember once my mother unloaded the dishwasher across the room. Me, my father, and my brother hid around the corner, knowing none of us was man enough to go in that kitchen. We could not handle her wrath. You know, sometimes, even though we teach our children to be very careful in their anger, sometimes anger is justified. Sometimes we have to react in such bold terms as to grab people's attention. There are all kinds of gifts that mothers will get today. You may actually find that someone gets you a piece of pottery, beautiful piece of pottery. But what if I shattered it? Got your attention, didn't I? 
Did you know what I just did actually comes directly from the Word of God? Take your Bible to Jeremiah 19 and let me show you. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Go buy a potter's earthenware flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priest and go out into the valley of the son of Hinnom at the entry of the postherd gate and proclaim there the words that I tell you. Now I'm about to read verse 3, but before I do, you may need to turn one page. I want you to find verse 10. Look at verse 10 of Jeremiah chapter 19. God says to Jeremiah, then you shall break the flask. So last week we saw how Jeremiah was taken to the potter's house and shown the unformed lump of soft, pliable clay. But this week we see how Jeremiah is told, go back and buy a piece of finished pottery, a piece of valuable pottery, a piece of useful pottery. But buy it in its final form, a form where it cannot be reshaped or reformed. Buy it once it has already been formed and fired and painted and decorated. And take it out in front of the people and crush it in front of them. Why would God react that way? What would cause God to have Jeremiah take a perfectly useful piece of valuable pottery and crush it in front of the people? Why would God want to grab people's attention the way I grabbed yours just a moment ago? It has everything to do with what we celebrate today. The title of being a mom is one that should be esteemed and respected. But the default implication is, whether through birth, adoption, or foster care, you are a mother because God has blessed you with children. The same is true on Father's Day. And we get our love and esteem for children based off of our God. And let me tell you something about our God. If you want to conjure up his anger, hurt a child. The scripture is very clear that Israel had strayed from God's will in many ways. The book of Jeremiah is filled with an indictment. Many of you have been on this journey with me for some time, but some of you are new to us this morning. And so I would just remind you, perhaps if you're unfamiliar with the book of Jeremiah, that Jeremiah has been called to prophesy judgment against Israel, not because God is impatient or because God is quick to anger. Actually, the scripture teaches the opposite. God is patient and slow to anger. But years and years of rebellion against God had led to God having enough. God was ready to bust some pottery. He was ready to shatter some dreams because the people had strayed so far from his will. And if, as if a list of sins wasn't needed, we find one of the most horrible examples in Jeremiah 19. And it gives us the stage, if you will, on this beautiful Mother's Day, to make sure we have a strong foundation, a theology of why we value everything motherhood stands for, which is the implicit, incredible value of every child. Remember, I asked you to stop reading verse 3 with me so we could read verse, verse 10 in order to show you that what I just did a moment ago is what Jeremiah was told to do, and here's why. Jeremiah chapter 19 Beginning in verse 3, you shall say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such disaster upon this place that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. And here's why. Listen to verse 4. Because the people have forsaken me and have profaned this place by making offerings to other gods who neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known. And because they have filled this place with the blood of innocence and have, verse 5, 
built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal. And God wants to make sure that he establishes how this has nothing to do with him. He says, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come to my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, verse 6, when this place shall be no more called Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And in this place I will make void the plans of Judah and Jerusalem. And I will cause their people to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hand of those who seek their life. I will give their dead bodies for food to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city a horror, a thing to be hissed at. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of all its wounds. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters. He's talking about cannibalism. And everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and the distress with their enemies. Those who seek their life afflict them. I don't have the words to add to Jeremiah's words the utter despair of what is about to happen in this place. And when you come to a passage like this, you may wonder, why would pastor choose this on Mother's Day? Because I believe in the Word of God. And I'm preaching to the book of Jeremiah verse by verse, and I do not skip verses because I do not want a weak-kneed, spiritually anemic church. I want a church that feeds off the Word of God. And underneath the layers of these hard words coming out of Jeremiah is some truth that could not be more applicable today. I want to give you two simple truths. One, the anger of God toward the guilty proves the love of God for the innocent. God is angry here. So much so that he says, Jeremiah, you go take that vessel and you shatter it in front of them and you make sure they know that that is a living example of what I'm about to do to them and why. Because the blood of innocent children had cried out to God. One of the things that turned God against his own people was that they had practiced syncretism. Syncretism is simply trying to take multiple religions and put them together. And when the people of Judah began to discover Baal and the other false gods and the way in which they were worshipped in their effort to prosper and to fit in, they began to compromise on the God of heaven's word. And the ultimate compromise seems incomprehensible to me and to you. They involve themselves in child sacrifice. One of the gods of Baal that would be sacrificed to was Molech. This is an ancient depiction from a rabbi several hundred years ago as to how the sacrifice would take place. A large bronze statue of Molech would be constructed, yet he would be hollow. A massive fire would be built inside of the bronze statue. Bronze, like any metal, is a conductor of heat. And so the statue would literally glow red. And then the priests of Moloch would surround the statue with instruments and drums. And they would cry out as the parent would lay a living child on the hands of a fastly burning cast iron bronze statue. And the moment the child would begin to suffer, the priest would raise the volume of worship so that the child's screams could not be heard and the praise of Moloch could be heard. And God who sees everything saw this from heaven and he had had enough. He says in the word, this is not ever my will. The fact that he has to say that means that there had been such a mixture of religions that some people in Jeremiah's day honestly believed that God was pleased with child sacrifice. But the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, very clearly, years before Jeremiah, 
You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they have burned their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Just a few chapters down in the book of Deuteronomy, in the law, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughters as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer. All of this, we wonder, it's antiquated. This is ancient This is Indiana Jones material. This is not real life. Surely we as a people would oppose with you, Pastor, the sacrifice of children. Yet when you support people who make abortion on demand, you line yourself up against the God of heaven. We know that the United States of America surpassed 62 million abortions this year since Roe v. Wade in 1973. 62 million. In every state of the United States, children are trafficked for sex today. And the United States of America is the number one consumer of sex trafficking in the world the number one consumer. There are literally thousands of cases in the state of South Carolina every year of children being trafficked and most professionals tell us that the ability to track the statistics is next to impossible which only leads us to believe the number is far more than we realize. Pornography is the number one introduction to child trafficking and then it goes from there. I was reading one article of a young lady who had been delivered through the love of some Christians out of a life of being trafficked and out of a life of drug addiction. And she said during her times of being trafficked, she was bought by pastors, police officers, principals, teachers, everyday men that hid in plain sight in the suburbs of the state of South Carolina. And when we begin to think about those hard truths like that, we have to ask ourselves a question on this Mother's Day. What do we do about that? We have to start with the right theology of understanding God's love for children. If we don't start there, then we can pretend as though it's not around us and we can shield ourselves from the fact that God is paying attention to the innocent lives that are being hurt and damaged, just as he did in Jeremiah's day. In a world of trafficking and abortion and abuse, God loves and celebrates children. He does it over and over again in the scriptures. Think about Psalm 127. What does the Bible say? Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. And not to leave you grandparents out, you know what the proverbial writer says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 17, verse 6, grandchildren are the crown of the aged. You know who you are. You would have skipped your children. If you could have gone straight to your grandchildren. (laughs) Grandchildren are the crown of the age and the glory of children is their fathers. But then think about Jesus. Think about his interaction. The scripture teaches us over and over again that they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Jesus has better things to do, the disciple says. But Jesus, in Luke chapter 18, verse 16, called them to him and said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. It just keeps piling up. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not Enter it. I think the most beautiful picture of faith is going to play out on the side of every swimming pool this spring. The child nervously comes up to the edge. If their mother is overprotective, they'll have swimmies, a life jacket, goggles, and 200 proof sunscreen. (laughs) If the mother's had several kids, the child will be in its underwear. 
and the child's toes will hang over the edge of the pool, and the child's father will stand in the shallow end, or perhaps about waist high, well over the height of the child, and they'll say, jump, son, jump, sweetheart, I'll catch you. And nervously, some children will wait and wait and wait, but finally when they jump, they'll land simultaneously in the water and the arms of their father. And there are two kinds of fathers in the world today. There are some of you fathers who catch them and squeeze them tight, barely letting their feet hit the water. And there are fathers like me. <laughs> I know how to teach them to swim. I let them hit the, gra- hit the water. As soon as they disappear, I pick them up and hold them up. They're coughing and ye- Laurel's yelling. And then I go, see, I got you. And within just a few moments, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, but usually that day, they're swimming like fish all around. What are we asking the child to do on the edge of the pool? We're asking them to trust. Jesus knew how children's hearts worked, and he said, if you really want to know how to trust me, you be like that child on the edge of the pool, and you step out on faith and remember that I, as your father, will catch you. The scripture continues to teach us about children. I think about Mark chapter 9, and he sat down and called the 12 and said, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. But then he goes on to say something interesting. He took a child, so Jesus drew a child into the teaching. No doubt he had his hands on the shoulders of this little boy, this little girl. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, and this is what Jesus said to them in the book of Mark, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So we know, scripturally speaking, everything Jeremiah was prophesying against comes from the heart of a God who loves and celebrates, cherishes and values children. And this is why his anger is burning so hot. The next time you find yourself in a passage like Jeremiah 19 and you read about the utter destruction that's coming, remember what I told you. The anger of God against the guilty proves the love of God for the innocent. And I would also say a word to the guilty. There is only one unforgivable sin in the Scripture The Scripture teaches us that. It is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. To sense and witness the work of the Spirit of God and to deny it is to remain unconverted, to remain not born again, which means that even someone guilty of harming a child, even someone guilty of abusing a child, even someone in an alcoholic rage guilty of striking a child, even someone in this room today guilty of an addiction to pornography, which we know exploits children, even the person who would say, Pastor, I feel like the guilty and not the innocent today. The scripture clearly teaches that the grace of Jesus is sufficient to forgive that person's heart, but don't mess with God's timing. Today is the day of repentance. If you find yourself in a situation where your behavior, your habits, or your struggles have put children in danger, and if you've ever found yourself there, remember this. If God woke you up today, it was yet another opportunity to repent and to come to him and to fall on your face and to claim his grace and to ask for his forgiveness and to repent of your sin. But for those of you who have been victimized, remember what God has taught us through the book of Jeremiah. He has not neglected your victimization. He has not ignored or turned a blind eye to the molestation you experienced, to the neglect or the abandonment you went through as a child. He has not ignored what's going on. He is patient. He is kind. He is gracious. But God does and should express anger. In fact, I don't want a God 
who does not express anger against the exploitation of the innocent among us, most beautifully represented by children. The judgment of God in Jeremiah 19 on the guilty proves the justice of God for the innocent. So the anger of God proves the love of God, but secondly, the judgment of God proves the justice of God. Look what happens in this passage beginning in verse 10. Then you shall break the flask. And the scripture goes on to say, In the sight of men, and go with you, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, So I will break this people and this city. As one breaks the potter's vessel, so it can never be mended. Even the most crafty among you, with the best super glue available, could never take the pieces of the pottery on this stage and take it back to its original form. You might piece it together, but it will never be restored to what it was a few moments ago. And this is what God says about his judgment because he is a God of justice. The scripture goes on to say, beginning in verse 12, thus I will do this to this place, declares the Lord, to the inhabitants, the houses of Jerusalem, verse 13, and the houses of the king of Judah, all the houses on whose roofs offerings have been offered to all the host of heaven and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods shall be defiled like the place of Topheth. And then Jeremiah moves, verse 14. Then Jeremiah came from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, this is interesting, he had just been in what was going to become the valley of the slaughter, a place of death. A place where the remnants of broken pots and the bones of children have been excavated by archaeologists. And now he walks into the temple court. The interesting thing is, is that the law forbid that. The law forbid to come into the temple if you had been in contact with death. And what Jeremiah is doing by his physical presence is he is saying, this place is contaminated. This is a place that should be about life and love and the Lord. And it has become a place of death and destruction where the innocent blood of children is shed. And he says in verse 15, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon this city and upon all its towns and all the disaster that I have pronounced against it because they have stiffened their neck, refusing to hear my words. I cannot speak for our nation. I cannot speak for another individual's heart. But I hope as your pastor I can speak for you in saying, when we read a passage like this, We have to acknowledge that just as we are grateful for the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, I want you to know I'm thankful for the justice of God. I'm thankful that I can look into the eyes of every person who's ever been hurt, neglected, abandoned, molested, and I can say to them that while the timing may not be yours, the Lord's justice will be played out. He will bring judgment on the wicked, and he will defend those who are defenseless. The scriptures continue to bear this out, not only in Jeremiah chapter 19. Look at this reference that we see here from the scriptures when we begin to study Deuteronomy 10, 18. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. And there's something else here. The idea of God's justice is seen in our lives on the cross. You see, the cross is not just the place of the ultimate display of God's love. It is the ultimate display of God's justice. If God were not just, if God were not willing to judge sin, then there would have been no need for a Savior to die. But if God saw to it to not uphold his justice, then all of a sudden he's not just. If he's not just, then he's not holy. If he's not holy, he can't be trusted because he said in his word, I am both just and holy. So the cross not only is an intersection of two pieces of wood, the cross is the intersection of the love of God and the justice of God. The justice of God is upheld by God pouring out the judgment for sin on one who did not deserve it. 
And the love of God is displayed by God providing the person in our place to take upon himself our sins that he might fully pay the price and thereby upon Resurrection Sunday overcoming the death nail condemnation that our sin deserved. So the cross is the display of the judgment and justice of God, and it is the display of the grace and the love of God. So what should cross people do? If you're a cross person, which means you would say religion has not saved my life, Church attendance has not saved my life. Owning a big black Bible with a leather-bound cover has not saved my life. Being dipped in water has not saved my life. And even being taken to church as a baby and dedicated by my mother and my father has not saved my life. No, pastor, the cross of Jesus Christ has saved my life. If you are a cross person, then just as God loves justice, so should you, this is why the half-brother of Jesus in the book of James said, you want to know what religion is in the eyes of God? Religion that is pure and undefiled is not the right denomination, the right church, or the right outfit on Sunday. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows. Notice the vulnerable. Notice those who don't receive justice on this side of heaven. The orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Don't ever fail to connect the last part of the verse with the middle part of the verse. When I make subtle, small compromises with sin, I put myself in a position where I can begin to pray on the vulnerability of others, whether it be to mistreat someone in a lower position with you at work, whether it be to secretly harbor an addiction to pornography that we know exploits young girls left and right, whether it be to find yourself in a position where you don't use your leverage and authority to stand up for the voiceless and the unheard, but rather you and I continue to reap the benefits of being in the majority of whatever circle we walk in. Whether it be losing our ability to stop before we make quick judgment on other people whose lives we may not understand and ask ourselves a question, a question that never begs us to negotiate right and wrong, but to ask ourselves, how could I be a source of truth and compassion in this situation? Jeremiah had to break that flask that day to show them that God had had enough and that he was going to break a ruthless people because of his love for the innocent, his love for the tender, his love for the children of the future generations. I seem to remember something from my childhood. I don't know if you remember it. I seem to remember that Jesus loves the little children, that red and yellow, black and white, All are precious in his sight. What do we do as a people? How do we live out this passage? For those of you who are young, have children responsibly. How do you do that? You honor the Lord with sex and marriage. The state of Florida tracks the reasons women go in and have abortions. Ladies, I want you to know that every woman who has an abortion is loved by God. And that every woman who's represented on some statistic of abortion also represents a man who is not doing what he should be doing. 70% of the women surveyed said they just didn't want a baby. Just didn't want a baby. Statistically, across the nation, the overwhelming majority of children's lives that are lost in the womb are lost because people see them as an inconvenience. God's people have never had a problem 
condemning abortion. If you claim to know Jesus, you must be pro-life. There is no middle ground. You cannot read this Bible and ever defend any position where an innocent child's lives can be snuffed out for elective reasons. It's just not biblically acceptable. But if we're serious about that, we also must be serious about putting our children in the best possible position to have children responsibly, to rejoice over the gifts of purity, to demand of our young men chivalry, to celebrate among our young women purity, to shut off the smut we allow into their lives, which exploits young women as being valuable only to, degree, only to the degree that the images of their body can be liked by some lust-filled man on the other side of anonymity in the internet. To demand of our young sons that there is a certain way you should care and protect women. And to tell them that the world can attack masculinity all it wants. But God, if he made you a man, made you to protect and care for the women and children in your life. And stop apologizing to a spineless world that is assaulting our God with an assault on gender. He made them in his image male and female. And he did so to bring glory and honor to himself. And then when we're given children, we celebrate them, we love them, we teach them, and we discipline them. We tell them no, and we're not worried whether or not they like us. Don't need them to like me. Want them to fear me and love me. And when they're grown, then they can choose whether or not they like me. I do not stand before the court of my children's opinion. I stand before a holy God, and he's going to ask, did you take what I gave you and your wife, and did you mold them to love and honor me? And then, when God gives us extra, and he's given us so much extra, Leverage our homes and our lives for the unwanted, for the foster child, for the child who is an orphan, for the young unwed mother struggling, for the young man called in the situation of crisis pregnancy and needs guidance and wisdom. We are people who should run to that. When God looked at Israel, he said, I've lost my people and I have to crush them now because they're sacrificing their children. When he looks at us, he should say, these are cross people, people of justice and grace who love their children. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us of your love for children. Thank you, God, that we are living testimony of your grace and your mercy. For the person in this room who feels especially heavy-hearted, someone here today via the gift of internet or here live with us in this beautiful worship center may say, Pastor, I, I know that I'm not where I need to be. I know I found myself on the other side of a sermon like this. I, I've been guilty of making decisions that perhaps hurt the vulnerable, exploited the weak. Friend, I want you to hear my voice. Listen to me. You didn't come just to celebrate Mother's Day. You came for a word from God. Here it is. He loves you. He will crush you. But because he crushed Jesus, he can forgive you. Let me say that one more time. God loves you. He will crush you. He will not ignore sin. But because he loves you, he crushed his son Jesus that 
you might find forgiveness. Why don't you come and receive Christ today? Come to this altar and pray with one of our counselors. Come and kneel and ask for forgiveness for that abortion you've told no one about. Come and kneel and ask God for the grace to redefine your relationship with your girlfriend. Come and kneel and ask God to give you the wisdom to confidentially seek out biblical counseling for that pornography addiction. Come and deal with the Lord. It's not too late. He crushed his son on your behalf. But do not play around with your days. They are numbered. And God is a God of justice and judgment. He will not allow the innocent blood to be shed in our nation for an extended period of time. He will return. He is moving. Come do business with the Lord. For those of you who have received his grace, stop compromising with the way you're raising your children. Shut their phones off if you need to. Change the trash coming into your home. Forget about the world's enlightenment and tell them about men being masculine and women being feminine and rejoicing in the gifts of womanhood and manhood. Quit compromising with a world that wants you to think that medical care involves the snuffing out of the life of an unborn baby. It is a sin that smells of the smoke of hell. Stop compromising and stand for the lives of the vulnerable, the hurting. Get off the fence and fill out the foster care paperwork. Adopt a child if God has blessed you with the ability to do it. And if you know someone who has, slip them some money, pray for them, encourage them. Be counted, stand up, and be the people that celebrate the gift of children on this Mother's Day. I'm going to say amen, and when I do, we're going to sing. And as we sing, ever how God leads you to respond, you do so this precious Sunday morning. Father, you move now as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's.